I said, Amen. 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 Good morning, everyone, and good afternoon, rather. It's so good to see you today. God is good. God is good. God is good. On this January 20th, um, the third Sunday in January, we missed you last Sunday with the snow. Amen. The, but we're glad to see you out today, and God has gathered us together for his purpose today, and he has a word for us today. I forgot to mention that as we're in our fasting and prayer period, that there's also a pamphlet uh, available to help guide you in your in the dietary uh, restrictions, amen, if you choose to do so, amen. And we're going to look at an example, amen, from the word of God for people that fasted and prayed. So if you can turn with me in your Bibles to uh, Ezra chapter 8. Ezra uh, chapter 8. Ezra and Nehemiah are together. So if you run across Nehemiah, Ezra comes right before Nehemiah. They're both before Esther, Job, and Psalms. Ezra E-Z-R-A, chapter 8. We're going to be looking at verses 21 to 23. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. It'll be projected on the wall. I want to make sure everyone has access to the Word of God. Amen. Ezra 8, 21 to 23. From the New King James Version, it reads, And I proclaimed the fast there at the river Ahava, that we might humble ourselves before our God, to seek from him the right way for us and our little ones and all our possessions. For I was ashamed to request of the king an escort of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy on the road, because we had spoken to the king, saying, The hand of our God is upon all those for good who seek him. But his power and his wrath are against all those who forsake him. So we fasted and entreated, in other words, prayed to our God for this. And he answered our prayer. Yes. Amen. That is the word of the Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we, it's now preaching time, oh God. Give us listening ears that we may hear directly from your spirit. Use me as your instrument, oh God, that your words may flow freely and smoothly, that they may go forth and do what you're sending them out to do, that they won't return to you void, but they will accomplish what you're sending out. Transform us, oh God, through this worship experience and this preaching moment that we may all leave with a closer walk with you. In the wonderful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. From this text, please pray on the topic very simply. God answers your prayers and fasting. Amen. God answers your prayers and fasting. Amen. If you've ever watched the Olympics, anybody watch the Olympics? Yeah. In the, in the Olympics, in the summertime Olympics, there is an event called the high jump. Yes, and the high jump, the jumpers go and they have learned and gotten their muscle memory through training to run and twist their bodies around and yes. jump over the bar. And somehow that gets you up higher uh, when you do all of that. Uh, those regular high jumpers, I'm going to call them, jump about seven feet. Uh, and they run, like I said, they throw their backs over and they get up to about seven feet. But then there's another kind of high jumper. They jump about 18 feet. They back up, they look down the runway, and they've got something in their hands. Yes. A pole in their hand and they start running down the track and they stick the pole into a hole and they lean their weight on that pole and it bends 
and then flexes and springs them up over even higher than a regular high jumper. Those pole vaulters couldn't get to that 18 foot level without assistance. They needed some help. Some of us have mountains that we've got to climb. Mountains that are in front of us. There's a crossbar and we have tried the high jump method in the flesh over and over again. We tried it with our own power. We've tried this technique and that technique. Yes. We've seen that mountain and we've backed up and we've said, mountain, you're not going to keep me down any longer. Yes, sir. We grit our teeth with the power of positive thinking, with New Year's resolutions, with mindfulness and resolve not to repeat our mistakes. Yes. We take off and we jump two feet above the ground when there's an 18 foot beam in front of us. Some of us have been jumping that same two feet for 30 years and 50 years of our lives and the bar is still up there 18 feet high. In fact, sometimes it keeps inching up higher and higher as every year goes by. Maybe what you need is a pole vault. You need something that you can lean on when you get to your problem so that you can go higher, maybe higher than you've ever been before. You need a pole that'll help you over the mountain. The pole vault for the bars in your life are fasting and praying. Ezra faced a mountain in his life. God had called Ezra to lead God's people out of exile in Babylon back to the promised land. And specifically, when they got back to the promised land to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. The first return of people occurred 500 years before Christ, 538 years before Christ to be exact. As in Ezra 1 through 6, chapters 1 through 6, describes the return from Babylon of a first group of people and the rebuilding of the temple. In Ezra chapters 7 through 10, the rest of the book describes the first year of work of Ezra and trying to get the people back to the promised land. So in Ezra chapter 8, it's very interesting because it shows how the people of God act. And it shows how those that are called by God have to deal with God's people. That got mighty quiet. No amens on that one. Ezra had to deal with God's people. So let's look at what he had to deal with. When we read Ezra 8 verse 1, it says, These are the heads of their family, of their father's houses. And this is the genealogy of those who went up with me from Babylon in the reign of King Artaxerxes. And then the next several verses list the names of the people that went. Now, when he got those people together, we get down here in verse 15, and it says, Now I gathered them by the river that flows to Ahava, and we camped there three days. And I looked among the people and the priests and found none of the sons of Levi there. Now why was that significant? God had called his people to leave exile, to go back to Jerusalem, to rebuild the temple, and the people that God had chosen to work in the temple, the Levites, were absent. The church workers were absent. The ones that were going to take care of the worship, the ones that were going to be the worship leaders, the ones that were going to make sure everything was in place and in its right place, we're absent. I'm talking about dealing with 
God's people. Ezra looked around and took account. Everybody was ready in the congregation, but the leaders, the priests were there. So some of the leaders were there, but the Levites were absent. So Ezra was dealing with a situation of confusion. It's like, Lord, you told us to go to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. But some key players are missing in this process. So Ezra put out a call and told the leaders, hey, go back and recruit those people from the tribe of Levi and tell them there's work to do. Didn't they hear the call of God that we're moving back to Jerusalem? Didn't they hear the call of God that there's work to do in the temple? Go back and ask them. Now before you get too hard on them, think about our own situation. Yes, yes, yes. God has gifted, gifted each of us Amen. to be active in the church. Yes. To contribute in some way in kingdom building. Yes, you can read it for yourself in Romans 12 verses 4 through 8. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, yes. where the spiritual gifts are lifted, listed in Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, God has given us gifts in the church in order to do various things in the church. Yes. Paul makes it very clear in his writing that the gifts aren't all the same, that we all have different roles, and God uses those different roles to build up his church. Amen. Amen. You see, it's the diversity that helps us build and to grow. As long as we're all focused on Christ together, yes. the Lord wants to use our spiritual gifts, amen, to build up New Life Missionary Baptist Church. Amen. amen. So my suggestion to you is don't wait to be recruited yes. like Ezra had to do. Go on and get to work. Amen. There's no need in hindering God's program yes. Yes. by holding back. If you don't know what your spiritual gift is, fast and pray. Yes, and ask God what it is. Yes. Ask Him what your role is in this place. Yes, and then get busy using what God has given you. Hallelujah. In verses 18 to 20, we see it didn't take long for God to answer the prayer. Just to summarize there, we're not going to read all of that, but you can... Count like I, I can. There were 38 Levites that responded. And there were 220 temple servants to help out those Levites. So 258 people were now added to the number who had the role to be busy in the temple. To get the temple ready for worship and to lead in worship. So now here we are in verse 21. The focus of... Our message today. In verse 21, Ezra had all the people ready to make the journey. Now, how far was the journey? What was in front of them? They were in Babylon. They were going to go to Jerusalem. According to my studies, the distance was approximately 900 miles. That's like walking from here to Tampa. I measured it this morning on my app. From here to Tampa was eight, from my house to Tampa was 888 miles. So it's even beyond that. The scholars suggest that that was about a four month journey for these people. Hundreds of people. God's people. Walking through dangerous territory. They hadn't gotten to it yet in the text, but what they had in mind was they were going to take back what was stolen from God. Yeah. You see, because you remember the history that when the Babylonians came into Jerusalem, the first thing they took was all of the gold and silver and all of the riches out of the temple. Yes. They stripped Jerusalem of its identity as God's people, yes. and they looked like a defeated and poor people. Yes. They took all the rich people, the noble people, out of Jerusalem, you know some of their names, Daniel, yes. 
Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and others were taken out in exile so that they could improve life in Babylon. So they took the smartest people out. And you know that God prospered Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You can read that in the book of Daniel. While they were in exile, God used them in a mighty way. So now they're coming to take back what God has stolen. All of that gold. All of that silver. Tons of it. They were going to have to travel back 900 miles to take that back to the temple. That's later in the text. But before all of that, right? Ezra has all of this in his mind. Lord, how are we going to make it? How are we going to get through Ezra, in front of Ezra was a huge mountain, dangerous territory. So Ezra's got some things that he can teach us here based on what he had to go through. If you're experiencing some high mountains in your life, there's some things here that we can learn from Ezra to apply in our lives. The trip was going to be difficult through some dangerous territory and was going to take about four months some of us don't even want to go out and do outreach for 40 minutes. Amen. Some of us will barely stay down on our knees for four minutes in prayer. When we do outreach to reach the unreached, I tell you, you can do 40 minutes of walking. Amen. Amen. You might even be able to do four hours of walking and getting out into the community. Amen. So, yes, we have some mountains to jump over. In order to grow this church with new members. Amen. Are you ready to use your pole vault? Yeah. Are you ready to get ready and use what God has given you and use your pole vault yeah. in order to spring yourself up over? Hallelujah, the bar that's in front of us. Yeah. Yeah. I know it's a challenge. Amen. But God has given us everything we need. <laughs> Amen. In order to make this journey. Yeah. Yeah. We can use prayer and fasting. Amen. To get us on the right track. Amen. Amen. To help us get us up over the high bar. Amen. So let's look at the first thing. It's in verse 21. The first words there. Then I proclaim the fast. That's something we can learn from Ezra. When you're facing a mountain. When you don't know exactly how God is going to work it out. The first thing. Proclaim a fast right where you are. Proclaim a fast right where you are. Ezra, they had camped out for three days by the river. And now it was time to go. The Levites and the others had gotten there. And now the first thing was not let's go. Not let's go back and pack up. Not let's go get all the gold ready and get on this journey. The first thing was fast. He proclaimed a fast right where they were. In other words, whatever spiritual condition they were in, they declared a fast. He didn't tell them, go back and purify yourself. Go back and do this. Go back and do the other. Get ready for the journey. Proclaim a fast. Before they made all the physical preparations... Ezra wanted to make some spiritual preparations. So he got the spiritual pole vault ready by denying self before God. Let's read the rest of that text, verse 1. Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava that we might humble ourselves before our God. They had to humble themselves. They had to realize that they had to rely on God for this 900 mile journey that they were about to take these four months night and day four months 120 days night and day four months of travel in the dangerous territory enemies coming in probably wanting to steal some of that gold and silver that they had in mind on taking the first thing a spiritual order was to get the spirit right yeah. to keep the right perspective before God and not before the people. To seek from God what, what God wanted us to do. What God wanted them to do. 
And then he was specific in his prayer to seek from him the right way for us and our little ones and all our possessions. In his calling for the fast, he was specific about what to pray for. Amen? Amen. He was specific that he wanted the people to humble themselves, to seek God's face, that God would give them the right way for us to go, and the little ones and all their possessions. In other words, they had high expectations yes. of an almighty God. Amen. They knew that God could do great things. Yes. And so they put it all on the altar before God. Amen. They didn't hold anything back. Yeah. Do you ever find yourself maybe holding some things back? Mm. Well, the Lord doesn't care about that. It's too small or it's too big or the Lord can't do anything about that anyway. Learn from Ezra. Put it all on the table. Amen. Yourself, your children, all of your possessions. Put it all, whatever it is that God has in mind, get your spirit right and proclaim a fast. Yeah. Right where you are takes us up to the second thing. Amen. Amen. That we can learn from Ezra is right in verse 22. And that is to brag on God's power. Brag on God's power. Now, what does bragging look like? No. Bragging doesn't look like that. Bragging is telling people. I'm going to tell you about my God. I'm going to tell you how great my God is. I'm going to tell you what's going on. I'm going to tell you how I'm trusting in God. I'm going to tell you that God has providence. He has guidance. He's going to make a way. The mountain is huge, but I know my God. Like the, like the, the praise team saying, like the praise team saying, God made a way. Whether he's going to move the mountain out the way or give you the strength to get over it, Amen. God is going to make a way. Amen. Now let's see what bragging Ezra did. For I was ashamed to request of the king an escort of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy on the road. Why? Because we had spoken to the king saying the hand of our God is upon all those for good who seek him. They had already told the king that God is on our side. Yes. They had already told the king that God is going to make a way. Amen. There's no need for me to be scared now and ask the king for escorts, ask the king for help. Ezra said, I, I would be ashamed to ask for help right now. Because I've been telling the king all this time yes. how great my God is. Yes. Yes. I've been telling them God is going to make a way. Mm. I've been telling them, yeah, we got a 900 mile journey. Yeah. It's going to take four months. There's enemies along the way. They want our gold and silver. But my God is greater than all of those enemies. Yeah. Yeah. I would be ashamed to go back and ask that same person I've been testifying to yeah. that now I need some help from them mm -hmm. to help me get over. No, God's got you. Yeah. God is evil. Yeah. Brag about God. Yeah. If you're going to brag about something, testify of God's grace. Yes. Yes. Testify of God's greatness. I was in a, uh, at the gala uh, last night. Did I share that this morning or in Sunday school? About uh, Steny Hoyer. And worship? Okay. All right. So I shared that already. The Lord at the at the gala last night on the Martin Luther King Jr. gala that the United Ministers Coalition held uh, our second annual gala last night um, some dignitaries were there one of them was Stanley Hoyer uh, our congressman for Southern Maryland he lives in St. Mary's County he worships in St. Mary's County what I, what amazed me was what he said from the stand to everyone listening hundreds of people in attendance he said and this was early on in his, in his talk. He was talking about the importance of community service and working in the community. But then he said, but that work does not save me. I'm not saved because I'm working my way to heaven. Well, you can't work your way to heaven. I'm saved because I'm covered by the blood of Jesus. 
He knows clearly in his mind that his salvation is not based on what he has done, but is based on what Jesus Christ has done. And I'm glad to have a leader like that. I hope that we need to pray for our leaders right now. We need to pray for them because the enemy is at move. There are forces at work right now. The principalities in high places. I'm, I'm going to talk about that some more coming right up. Amen. <laughs> they need to get focused on God. We need to brag about our God. So I'm glad that we got at least one leader up there that can brag about his God. And brag about our God. We need to seek God. And right here we see that Ezra was saying the hand of our God is upon all those for good who seek him. Yes. Now what does that remind you of? Romans 8.28. Yes. All things work together for good. For those who are who love the Lord. For those who are called according to his purpose. Amen. 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 That That is right there. That's what Ezra was saying. I've been telling the king all things. Work together for good. For those who love God. For those who are called according to his purpose. God is going to bless those people. But the ones that are against them. The ones that stand up against them. He's going to take care of them. Yeah. I don't have to worry about it. He didn't say... I got I to gotta get my weapons ready. I got to be ready to fight. I need to be ready to kill. No, he said, but his power and his wrath are against all those who forsake him. Yeah. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., whose birthday was on the 15th and who we're celebrating tomorrow as a federal holiday, led a famous march from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama. That journey took four days. Even after Bloody Sunday on Selma's Edmund Pettus Bridge, the, pre the week or so before, Dr. King and the people rebounded from that day and departed Selma on March 21st, 1965 and arrived in the state capital, Montgomery, on March 25th. Here are some highlights from his speech that he gave after they arrived in Montgomery. He said last Sunday, more than 8,000 of us started on a mighty walk from Selma, Alabama. We have walked on meandering highways and rested our bodies on rocky byways. Some of our faces are burned from the outpourings of the sweltering sun. Some have literally slept in the mud. We have been drenched by the rains. Our bodies are tired and our feet are somewhat sore. But today as I stand before you and think back over that great march, I can say as Sister Pollard said, a 70-year-old Negro woman who lived in the community during the bus boycott, and one day she was asked while walking if she wanted a ride, and when she was and when she answered no, the person said, "Well, aren't you tired?" And with her ungrammatical profundity, she said, "My feet is tired, but my soul is rested." Yeah. And in a real sense, this afternoon, Dr. King said, we can say that our feet are tired, but our souls are rested. He went on and talked about why we're here and that we are here in front of the capital of Montgomery, Alabama. We're on the move, he told them. He told the people, listen, and he wrapped up his speech by saying this. I must admit to you, there are still jail cells waiting for us. Dark and difficult moments. We will go on with the faith that nonviolence and this power transform dark yesterdays into bright tomorrows. Yes, yes. We will be able to change all of these conditions. He went on to say, I know you're asking today, how long will it take? I come to you, I come to say to you this afternoon, however difficult the moment, 
however frustrating the hour, it will not be long because truth pressed to earth will rise again. How long? Not long because no lie can live forever. I just need to pause right there because Dr. King's words just continue to be relevant even today. How long? Not long because no lie can live forever. How long? Not long. Because you still reap what you sow. Yes. How long? Not long. Because the arm of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Yes. How long? Not long. Because mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord, yes. trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. He has sounded forth the trumpets that shall never call retreat. He is lifting up the hearts of man before his judgment seat. Oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my feet. Our God is marching on. Amen, amen. amen. Dr. King, amen. He knew how to put those words together. Amen. He knew how to let people know that God was at action. Yes. Even though there were some things to climb. Amen. Even though some prayers and some fasting were going on. Yes. Amen. They still had some things that they had to get ready for. Amen. Which brings us up to verse 23 for the third thing. The third thing is God answers your prayer. Let's look at this. God answers your prayer and fasting. Let's look at verse 23. So simple. And yet profound. So we fasted and entreated our God for this. And he answered Amen. our prayer. Hallelujah. It reminded me of something so simple and something so profound. How you remember years ago when the prayer of, J of Jabez came out and was being taught and was being promoted and Amen. it caught fire because of his simplicity. Um, this person we hadn't heard of growing up in Sunday school, First Chronicles chapter 4, verse 10. And Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my territory, that your hand would be with me and that you would keep me from evil, that I may not cause pain. So God granted him what he requested. The power in that verse is the last sentence. So God granted him what he requested. The power of Ezra 8.23 is that God answered our prayer. I mean, God will answer your prayer. I, I know why 1 Chronicles 4.10 had so much power. Because the prayer was so simple and God honored that prayer. Your prayers don't have to be all sophisticated and get the right words and, and, and everything. God is looking at your heart. God wants you to come to Him and, and know that you have a pole ball in your hand called prayer and fasting. And He just wants you... To use that time with Him. Yes. To get with Him. And to spend some time with Him. To humble yourself before Him. Yes. To set aside your plate for a little bit. To set aside some meat. To set aside some food. To set aside some habit. To fast on some other thing. To turn off the TV for a little while. Turn off the distractions. Yes. Get down with God and spend some time with Him. Yes. Hold that pole vault in your hand. Take your aim. Get it ready. Get running down the track and put that pole into the hole and lift yourself up. Yes. God wants to raise you up. Yes. You can pray with faith because yes. faith is the key and prayer unlocks the door. Yes. You need to have a plan. If you need a plan, we got a brochure for you yes. on what to pray for with new life. Yes. Ezra entered into a prayer plan. He had a list in front of him. He led the people to pray. Yes. That's exactly what's going on here in New Life, and I appreciate 
Everyone that's participating, it's not too late. If you didn't start with us last Monday, that's okay. It's not too late. Get started tomorrow. Start today. Determine a plan later on in the week. It doesn't matter when you get started. Just get started. Too often we pray superficially just on the surface. I tell you, God has blessed me these past seven days. God is looking for some people that want to get busy with some serious prayer. Not just some superficial prayers. Some serious prayer. Where you can concentrate. It's okay to learn from somebody else's prayer. As long as you're listening intently with the intent to learn from that other person's prayer. You, and that's okay. You, you, we, we need to learn how to pray. Yeah. You remember the disciples? They asked Jesus, teach us how to pray. And Jesus taught them how to pray. Yeah. We need to do the same thing. If your prayer life is superficial, if your prayer life is weak, if you're not spending much time in prayer, I've been telling you all this time, much prayer, much power. Yeah. Little prayer, little power. No prayer, no power. It all begins with prayer. Ezra showed us what serious prayer was. And God answered his prayers. God is going to answer your prayer and fasting as well. But I didn't come to promote Ezra. Ezra did some great things. And we can learn from this powerful prayer. Jabez did some great things. I didn't come necessarily to promote him either. Dr. King did some great things. And he's an excellent role model to follow. I I follow Dr. King a lot. I I invest in, in his works, this testament of hope, the essential writings and speeches of Martin Luther King Jr., I've got an audible book, The Radical King, um, uh, edited by Dr. Cornell West. I mean, I just listen to King. I can't get enough. I look at YouTube videos of his speeches. I I just can't get enough. But I'm not here to talk about Dr. King. Because there's one greater than all of them. And his name is Jesus. Yeah, Jesus looked at four days of marching from Selma to Montgomery and said, that's pretty good, y'all. But when Jesus was called to go into his fasting and praying, how long did he go in? 40 days. 40 days of fasting and praying into the wilderness. And then at the end of the 40 days, the devil showed up. I'm here to remind you that the devil's not happy with us right now. I'm here to remind you that the devil is mad at new life right now. That when you get serious with God and you get down in prayer and you're fasting and you're looking to God to do something new to help us reach the unreached, God is going to God is going to do great things and the devil is angry. Jesus proclaimed a fast in his own life and he fasted for 40 days in the wilderness out in the desert. Jesus made it through all of that. So he knows what it's like. We're just doing 21 days. Jesus went without food. We're still eating. We're just not eating meat. Amen. We're just not eating sweets. Amen. But I tell you, I feel better. I feel stronger. I got getting them vegetables in, getting that fruit in, finding them nuts to eat, finding them beans to eat. I mean, it's a great thing. It's a great journey, and God is able. We'll see what what he does in us. Amen. As we get closer to 21 days. Amen. I can't wait. I can't wait. I can't wait. Amen. But Jesus, our Savior and our Master, fasted for 40 days in the wilderness. Jesus bragged about God. Jesus, you can look it up. I'm not going to bring out any particular things, but he was constantly pointing to the Father. He was constantly saying, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. There's no difference between me and the Father. When you heard my words, my words are coming from the Father. I'm here to brag about the Father. I'm here to tell you about the Father. I'm here to lift him up and to make sure you don't understand where I came from. Because when you see me, I came from the Father. Jesus bragged about the Father. 
In fact, there is one thing I want to point out that comes to mind. There were 5,000 people that Jesus was preaching to. And they got hungry listening to him. And Jesus told the disciples, go find something to eat. They're hungry. The disciples got all practical on them. Well, Jesus, we don't have enough money to feed all these people. Jesus said, don't worry about that. The Father, I'm bragging about the Father right now. Yes. The Father's going to make a way. He didn't bring us out here to leave us by ourselves. Yes. Go out there and find out if you can find something that the people got. They found a little boy that had two fish and five loaves of bread. He said, well, bring that. We're going to use what we got. Amen. He lifted it up to the Father and said, Father, yes. you have created this moment to give you glory. Amen. You know what to do. I'm not even going to ask you, but these people have needs. He brought it down and distributed the food, and they came back. Everybody got full, yeah. just 5,000 men, not counting the women and children, yeah. and they had leftovers. I'm talking about an overflow God. I'm talking about a God that exceeds expectations. We can brag about that God. After that, Jesus had all these followers. He goes, oh, here's somebody that can feed me. Amen. Here's somebody that can meet my needs, so I'm going to follow him. So Jesus... At the end of that day, he went down and, 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 and he sent the disciples over to the other side of the lake. And he went to do what? Pray. To pray. Yes. He went to pray. He had to get away from the people and re-energize himself and spend some, some time in prayer. The disciples went on over to the other side and some people came up to the disciples. The, 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 the son was, was, um, uh, uh, had a demon inside of him, was demon-possessed. And the father said, disciples of Jesus Christ, can you cast out this demon? When Jesus got there, there was confusion because the disciples felt powerless. They felt like they couldn't do anything about it. When Jesus got over there, he said, this can only come out by prayer and fasting. Yes, Jesus knew the answer. Jesus knew what it took. Jesus knew the power that it took. Jesus answered the the, the, the prayer request through prayer and fasting. Yeah. He cast out that demon that day out of that young boy. He cast it out and separated that boy from what was bothering him. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's the kind of God we serve. Amen? Amen? We can celebrate Jesus today because he was here on earth in physical form. He was he born as a man. He was yes. born and grew up as a man. Showing us how to live and how to love each other, how to treat each other. That made the world hate him. Hated him so much that they took him and nailed him up on the cross. Yes. And killed him up on the cross. What they didn't know is that they were following the Father's will. That they were following God's plan. Yes. And while he hung on that cross, yes. he took on your sins and my sins. They were nailed on the cross, not in part, but the whole, as the songwriter says. Yes. And our sins died up on that cross with him. He took our sins away. Hallelujah. Those that would receive him into their hearts as his savior. They, they are the ones that are saved. They are the ones whose sins are forgiven. They took him down off of that cross. They buried him in somebody's tomb. But I'm glad that on the third day morning, hallelujah, he got up with all power in his hands. He went back to live on the right hand side of the Father. And he sent in his place the Holy Spirit, amen, to live inside of us. He sent Holy Ghost power, amen. Why? Acts 1.8 says that we might be witnesses, that we might be witnesses for him to reach the unreached, amen, to share and brag about our Lord and Savior and share the good news of this great news called the gospel, amen, that others too might be saved, that others might come and repent of their sins and turn their lives around. Yeah. Amen. And receive Jesus Christ as their Savior. Yeah. Who wouldn't serve yeah. a God like that? Yeah. Who wouldn't serve a God like that? Amen. Yeah. Amen. 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 Yeah. Amen. God answers. God answers your prayers.
your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. church are wide open, you may realize today that you have not received Jesus Christ as your Savior. You've never repented from your sins. You've never asked the Lord to come and live inside of you. If there's one today that wants to make that decision today, you may come now. You hear the door lock, knocking on the door of your heart. The Bible says open up the door and he will come in and sup with you. He will come in and eat with you. He will come in and live inside of you. Is there one today? Is there one today? Thank you.